In part, this is a science film. In part, this is a proposal from me to you for dramatically changing the world. Mostly, this is all extremely interesting. It explains truly life-changing breakthroughs in physics and a special topic that deals with water, droughts, famine, and the planet's environment. Altogether, this film covers three main topics. The solution to the question, what is time? The grand unification of physics and the solution to fusion energy. In my opinion, directly and indirectly, this new physics is going to dramatically change your life. One very interesting, very specific benefit of this new physics is it will enable us to collect massive amounts of fresh water in hot deserts. Obviously, a benefit like that would greatly help to eliminate droughts and famines. In essence, this new physics is very green. One model indicated one pipe could collect 11,000 gallons of water per day. That is over 4 million gallons of water per year. That hot desert model used typical heat and humidity levels. There are too many variables involved to analyze the details here. The fact is these pipes can collect a lot of water. Keep th this in mind. In the skies over every hot desert, even when the sky is completely clear of clouds, there is tons of water. It just has to be collected. Out of curiosity, I decided to check the current weather conditions in Bilma, Niger, when I originally wrote this. Now I understand most of the people here will not understand where Bilma is. So here is an approximate location on a map of Africa. This has got to be one of the more interesting locations in the world. At one time, maybe two or three million years ago, this location was about 100 meters beneath what was probably the largest lake in the history of the world. This town's elevation is now 358 meters above sea level. At one point, Lake Chad was at about 460 to 463 meters above sea level. It flowed due east and was the original head of the Nile River. Lake Chad was monstrously large and completely covered this area. Now, Bilma is located right in the heart of some of the worst desert locations in the world. That is a very remarkable change. As I research this, it is 40 degrees Celsius there. That is about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The humidity is only 7%. While that is very dry, the atmosphere in that area still contains unbelievable amounts of water. While there is not 100 meters of water directly overhead, the overhead atmosphere still contains tons of water. As proof of that, what is really odd is, Bilma is expecting heavy rain tomorrow. This is odd because this region averages having rain on only one day per year. So tomorrow just might be that lucky rainy day. Tomorrow, which when I write this is June 11, 2012, may bring Bilma its entire yearly rainfall. However, I ask you, in a hot desert, why rely on luck? In Bilma in June, the average morning humidity is 39%. When you consider how hot it normally is, that is a lot of moisture. In June, the average evening humidity is 23%, still decent. However, in June, they average zero millimeters of rain per year. In essence, even though they have a large amount of moisture in the air, they average zero rainfall. Now in July, the humidity averages are 54% in the morning and 28% in the evening. Keep in mind, 54% humidity is very humid. However, in July, they also only average zero millimeters of rain per year. 
they average no rain in July. To have an average of zero, you know it must be bad. Keep in mind, the real problem is not how much moisture is in the air. The real problem is not how hot it is. The real problem is there are no cold fronts. You need cold air. It doesn't matter how much moisture there is in the hot atmosphere. If there are no cold fronts to condense the water to trigger the rain, hot, humid air doesn't matter if you don't have something cold to condense it. Again, think about Bilma having an average morning humidity of 54% in July. Imagine that you are in a hot desert when the humidity is 54%. Imagine how that air would feel. That would be sticky. As I write this right now, where I live in Minnesota, the temperature is 33 degrees Celsius. That is 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Even with the humidity at 39%, it feels warm and sticky here. So let me emphasize, Bilmo's July average morning humidity 54% is very high. Now, later today in my hometown, the forecast predicts a cool front will come through. This should trigger thunderstorms. It did. The day I wrote that, we had heavy rains. And we even had a tornado warning in the towns immediately south of where we live. After that cold front went through and triggered the rains, the temperatures were significantly cooler. Normally, it is highly unlikely that a cold front is going to move through Bilma. Normally, cold fronts just can't make it across the hot Sahara Desert very easily. For at least 100 years, the prevailing winds in this area normally come from the northeast, blowing out of the middle of the Sahara. This is a Google, Google image of the Sahara Desert centered on Bilma. That is a dramatic image. Bilma's winds normally blow from one direction. In this image, the direction is obvious. The winds blowing from the northeast towards the southwest have been so strong, so significant, they have literally etched lines in the desert. Of course, when a cold front finally does move through, it also usually kicks up a massive dust storm. So keep this in mind. Even in the middle of hot deserts, the moisture is there. The moisture is in the atmosphere. In the absence of a natural cool front to trigger natural rain, we just need to force the water out of the atmosphere unnaturally. We just need to make the water condense out of the atmosphere. The key thing is, with these machines, we're simply not waiting around for the clouds to form and to do their job. The trick is to cool the air in these underground pipes. Do it constantly, make it economical, and supersize it enough to get the amount of water we desire. Each pipe acts independently. Obviously, it makes sense to have clusters of pipes at good sites. Of course, these pipes could be lined up by the hundreds. I have a specific example for you that integrates a solar updraft tower. Imagine a site in a hot, arid desert region with just 20 pipes. Such a machine could reasonably collect over 82 million gallons of water per year. As I mentioned earlier, the electricity that is needed to power these machines does not need to come from fusion energy. Here's an example of that. Let's start with an overhead view. The pipes are laid out in a circle. The air is sucked in on the outside of the circle and expelled on the inside of the circle. Now, let's look at this from the side view. Notice the solar updraft tower in the center. It is made of cement. Attached to the tower is a canopy made of clear plastic. In this overhead view, you can see how the canopy extends out a long way from the tower. Sunlight passes through the canopy and heats the air underneath it. This air flows up the stack of the updraft tower. 
The updraft from the stack keeps the air flowing. Underneath the canopy, the airflow looks like this. Normally, in a solar updraft tower, the air flows underneath the outside edge of the canopy. In this design, the outside edges of the canopy could be completely or partially closed off. That way, the air can only be drawn through the underground pipes. In essence, the force of the updraft inside the updraft tower helps to suck the air through the underground pipes. Solar updraft towers use this wind to generate electricity. At the base of the solar updraft towers, designers usually place wind generators. This design has four. However, any number greater than or equal to one could be used. Combining these water collection pipes with a solar updraft tower would reduce the amount of electric electricity needed by the fans for the underground pipes. Any additional electricity needed by the fans or by the cooling system could be generated by the updraft tower's wind turbine generators. While you might be impressed by this, while you might be thinking, integrating these pipes with a solar updraft tower seems very synergistic, keep in mind solar updraft towers do have their own drawbacks. In my opinion, it would be much better to simply power these pipes by using fusion energy. But still, in my opinion, if somebody is planning on building a solar updraft tower, then they really should consider integrating these tubes into their design. Keep in mind, the vast majority of moisture in the atmosphere comes from the oceans. The sun evaporates the water from the surface of the oceans. This is a form of solar energy. There is no way anybody could ever build a solar evaporator as big as this natural system. The moisture that evaporates into the atmosphere over the oceans is then transported over continents naturally. There is no way anybody could ever build a pipeline as big as the atmosphere.